Dr. Eric Tanya Kozo is John Stamble Professor of History at Cornell University. He is the director of the Comparative Muslim Societies Program in the Cornell Modern Indonesia Project. He is also a co-chair of the Cornell Migrations Initiative. Professor Tanya Kozo is the author of three monographs, Secret Trades, Porous Borders, Smuggling and the States Along a Southeast Asian Frontier, The Longest Journey, Southeast Asians and a Pilgrimage to Mecca, and most recently, In Asian Waters, Oceanic Worlds from Yemen to Yokohama, which is just published this year by Princeton University Press. He is the co-editor of the journal Indonesia. He has also edited and co-edited 10 books, including the three-volume Asia Inside Out, published by Yale University Press. He is also a co-editor of the forthcoming Cambridge History of Global Migration, a monumental project to rewrite the history of modern migration on a planetary scale. Professor Tanya Koso, first of all, congratulations to the publication of your new book, In Asian Waters, Oceanic World from Yemen to Yokohama. It's a book on Asian history, but it is also a different type of Asian history book. Because when most people think of Asia, we think about the Asian continent or the eastern part of the Euro-Asian continent, so to speak. But your book looks at the Asian history from the maritime or the oceanic view. Most intriguing to me is you compare the seas of Asia to the Mediterranean. So can you please tell us why you're interested in exploring Asian history from the maritime perspective? And how does this perspective tell us a different Asia than what the traditional continental narrative Asia has been telling us? Okay, yeah, sure. Thank you, first of all, Yuan, for having me. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite interested in uh, how the maritime connects different uh, Asian societies. And of course, I'm not the first person to do this and don't cl uh, claim to be. Uh, there's been plenty of people before me who have been interested in these kinds of trajectories. And, you know, if we think about Asian history, terrestrial history and borders, play a huge role uh, in that kind of story, maritime history is much less important. But, you know, I think if modern Western conception of borders didn't appear in much of Asia for quite a while, in the post-Westphalian sense, uh, there's still been a kind of marking off of societies like one against another. So that that is really important in thinking about the terrestrial ways that we think about Asia. But if we go towards the water, the borders to some extent disappear, at least historically. Mm -hmm. And not only do those borders disappear between these places that we have identified as almost kind of like um, balls that uh, knock against each other on a, on, on a billiards game, uh, area studies rubrics melt away too. So mm -hmm. when we think about West Asia, South Asia, East Asia, or Southeast Asia, the part of Asia that I, that I work in most, the academy is organized in those ways. Uh, but really, you know, on the ground and on the seas, history was much more of a continuum, particularly in the oceans, it moved from port to port to port. So I think this approach allows us to see how regions influenced each other, at least to some degree. And in that, the Mediterranean analogy has been uh, important. And again, there are certainly others before me who have uh, played with these concepts and done really important work. Uh, because what the Mediterranean showed us is that there were many different polities interacting uh, around a shared maritime arena. So Islam, Christianity, different political polities and kingdoms all were uh, being brought together by the Mediterranean. And of course, the most imp important and famous scholar in thinking about this uh, towards the beginning was Fernand Brodel. Yes. And he really reoriented this history to fit together. Uh, as a composite. So instead of just looking at Western European history, or just looking at the history of the Levant, or just looking at the history of the Maghreb in North Africa, he brought them all together into a single continuum based around water. And that, I think, was a very fecund idea. Right, right, right. Yeah, I'm also a big fan of Bordeaux. I have the books right behind me. <laughs> 
Yeah, thank you for this uh, comparison and the explanation of uh, the Mediterranean versus the seas of Asia. Another comparison that I have noticed in your book is comparing the maritime Asian societies versus the um, Zamia Highland societies. And you have cited the Jim Scott work of seeing like a state. So I wonder how does this seem like a state perspective different from the Zamia Highland versus from the Maritime Asian societies? Sure, yeah. I mean, uh, Jim Scott has been obviously very, very influential on many people and uh, uh, certainly on me. Uh, he was one of my three teachers at Yale when I was a graduate student there. And uh, I learned a lot from listening to him, I, I, I hope at least, uh, and trying to see history in society in different kinds of registers than some of the normative ways that we often try to do this. So for example, for, the, for what you just uh, said, Yuan, about uh, elevation, uh, this notion of Zomia that uh, Jim Scott and Willem van Schendel, the anthropologist of uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, kind of brought about together. Jim is always very careful in, in uh, giving Willem van Schendel credit for this idea too. Uh, they were lo really looking at uh, South and Southeast and parts of East Asian society, uh, uh, less about borders, less about language groups and more through elevation. Mm -hmm. So looking at a kind of swirl of peoples above the floodplains of the great rivers of Asia, uh, where states were really uh, normatively forming in these river plains. So I think that there, in some ways, at least, you can view the sea in some similar sense, uh, the sea levels out societies in some, in some ways. And the sea also has some of these kinds of tran transgressive possibilities of Jim Scott and Willem van Schendel's uplands. Out and away from the port, uh, there are projects of resistance against existing orders, whether these orders are indigenous or uh, increasingly colonial as we move into the second half of the second millennium CE. Uh, all of these kinds of uh, resistance projects become possible. And that's clearly part of this book uh, as well. So if we want to go back and kind of look at a, a moment that is very important in thinking about this, we can go to the 17th century and think about the Dutch uh, jurist, Hugo Grotius, who talked in the, in the 17th century about these two notions of mare liberum and mare clausum, or open seas and closed seas. Uh, the closing of the seas to sovereignty, to patrols, to legal norms. Uh, for example, the Portuguese Carthage system, which became important, in, especially in the parts of the Indian Ocean uh, for a time. Uh, this is all important in thinking about how the seas connect, but also how the seas start to be marked off. So this was really a remarkably open field, the sea, for most of, uh, uh, most of Asian history. And that is one of the attributes that interests me most. I see. Thank you so much for this comparison. And now I want to talk about some of the details in your book. You divided your book into different parts, and each of those parts have different focuses. You talk about all kinds of different forces that bind together the maritime Asian societies. For example, religions. A very prominent force, very prominent Asian in binding all those societies together. So can you tell us why and what religions are important in shaping the history of maritime Asia? Yeah, sure. Um, religion was one of the six rubrics that I decided to use for the book. And I should be clear that another scholar could have used six completely different rubrics and uh, also written a, a book about this topic. And um, it could be equally interesting and equally valid, at least to my, to my, uh, uh, to my view. Um, I tried to look in two chapters at how religions influenced uh, maritime contact between different parts of Asia. So one of the chapters uh, takes place a little bit earlier than much of the rest of the book, but that is looking at how Buddhism and Hinduism crossed the Bay of Bengal um, from what we today think of as mostly South Asia moving to Southeast Asia. And then a second chapter focused more on Islam and Christianity, but in one place, in Zamboanga, which is uh, one of the main uh, port towns in southwestern Mindanao in the Philippines. So how did religion move human beings across these open maritime spaces? And what kinds of formulations 
came of those movements. This was the kind of thing I was trying to look at. Uh, so, you know, if we if we can think about kind of um, classical medieval or early modern Southeast Asia, if we can use those terms, of course, it's dangerous to use terms from other parts of the planet to describe a different part of the planet. Uh, if we think about that for the first of these two chapters between Buddhism and Hinduism moving across the Bay of Bengal, and then more the kind of early modern colonial age into the post-colonial age for a place like Mindanao in the, in, in the Southern Philippines, I tried to kind of get at some of these questions using four of these different uh, major religions and how they moved uh, through Asia's seas. I see. Thank you so much. I wonder, can you talk a bit about other rubrics such as environment and technology? Sure, yeah. Uh, two of the other rubrics uh, focused on uh, environmental forces and technologies of the sea. So for the environment, again, uh, all of these rubrics are organized into two chapters. So there's six rubrics and always two chapters. Uh, the two chapters there are focused on marine goods uh, moving between Sino-Southeast Asian spheres, so between China and the various societies of Southeast Asia. And then the second chapter focused on spices, which were coming from South India and moving especially towards Southeast Asia, but also globally. Uh, and in these two chapters, I was trying to look at how commodities such as these, uh, uh, marine goods in the first chapter and spices in the second, how they link areas that are often not examined together. So China and Southeast Asia or South and Southeast Asia um, for the two chapters combined. And this is one of the ways that we can see uh, how the sea linked these various places and how telling a story that moves across these nominal uh, area studies boundaries of South, Southeast and East Asia uh, actually becomes useful. For technologies, uh, again, there's two chapters, one focusing on the building of light lighting apparatuses uh, in the oceans. That is to say, things like lighthouses or beacons and buoys. And then the second chapter was about hydrography or the science of sea mapping. And these were both vital also because they uh, were attempts by states to order the quote unquote unruliness of the sea. Some of the possibilities I talked about a few, a few minutes ago. So these states were in a real uh, uh, battle to try to manage these watery domains and to, to really see and to know the seas around them. So in that sense, uh, we can think of Foucault and the connections that he talked about between knowledge and power. This was something really actively uh, in the minds of these colonial governments as they started to stretch across Asia's seas uh, over these several hundred years. So throughout the book, I have these kinds of dyads of chapters that play off each other. One is usually, in each of the rubrics, one is usually on a larger scale, expanding outward uh, in its action, and one is usually in a smaller uh, scale, looking at how one place or one region or one locale deals with the seas. And together, the one large chapter and one, the one smaller chapter act as kind of apertures. That is to say, one is widening the field division and one is closing the field division towards whatever the subject matter is at hand. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you for also explaining the inner logic of how you structure your larger chapter and how your smaller chapters. Now I would like to move on to ask you some questions about your sources. So you have used many, many interesting sources in your writing, conventional and unconventional. For example, shipwreck archaeology is one of the most interesting and intriguing sources you have used in this book. And uh, I'm sure other people probably have different views, but they probably all agree that shipwreck is the most intriguing one. So can you please give the audience some examples of the shipwrecks you have mentioned in your book? And what are the things not recorded in traditional sources, but are revealed in the shipwrecks? Oh, OK, sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, shipwrecks are, are deeply interesting, uh, of course. Um, and the kind of underwater archaeological data that we can get from shipwrecks is really fascinating. And as, um, as our science and technology becomes better, these possibilities become better, too, uh, as we move through time. So in one chapter in particular, uh, I look at um, particularly wrecks in what is today uh, uh, the waters off uh, Thailand or what, what was Siam in historical time. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in this period between the late 14th and late 15th centuries when what we think of as kind of 
the cusp of the contact age. Uh, and one of the things that becomes clear is that there was just an enormous amount of ceramics that were moving on Asia's seas uh, during this time. And they came from many different places, uh, uh, locales like Sukhothai, uh, these were Sawankolok wares from what's today Northern Thailand. There were also Cham wares found from uh, the central coasts of uh, what's today Vietnam. Uh, Burmese wares coming out of Burma too, uh, that have a very distinctive look. Even Burmese wares that were so important in uh, connecting Burma to the rest of uh, uh, Southeast Asia and even beyond Southeast Asia at this time. Uh, this is to say nothing of all of the kinds of Chinese wares that were coming in even much larger quantities than any of the Southeast Asian ceramic traditions and were being deposited through Southeast Asia and even further afield from the great Chinese kilns like Jingdezhen and other uh, Chinese kilns that were built to create export industries for the, for the Chinese economy. So there's many, many different kinds of specimens scattered in uh, the oceans all over Southeast Asia, but particularly around uh, the coast of Thailand where uh, a number of the wrecks that interested me, and I tried to look at five of these wrecks in a little bit more detail. Uh, but the ceramics are particularly important because of what they do for us in terms of dating. Uh, so little survives in the monsoon climate of monsoon Asia that we only have a few different kinds of commodities that are able to actually uh, stand the test of time and ceramics are one of those. So the ceramics actually help tell us a lot about the dating of different people moving through Asia's seas at different moments and through different uh, spaces. So that can be really uh, exciting. You know, it's a little bit macabre to think about it this way, but the sea is a tomb. And actually we could follow lines of skeletons, human skeletons throughout Asia's seas as well, linking places as far afield as Japan, China, the different ports of Southeast Asia and on into the Indian Ocean to South Asia and the Middle East. There are literally these lines of skeletons that cross the ocean bottoms. Uh, and that's one way to think about uh, the passage of all these human beings as well. Well, wow, that is so fascinating. So now I want to ask you about smuggling and the pirates. So uh -huh. you use the phrase illicit histories to describe these, you know, activities probably condemned in the official histories. Can you tell us what sources you use to write the illicit histories of smugglers and the pirates? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I'm quite interested in the history of smuggling. I, I wrote my first book um, back in 2005 uh, uh, about a history of smuggling in colonial Southeast Asia, what was becoming British Southeast Asia and, and Dutch Southeast Asia and the island world of Southeast Asia in the late 19th and early 20th century. And there's all kinds of sources that we can use for this, of course, um, uh, official statistics, archives, police seizures, juridical records, naval seizures, uh, all different kinds of things like this. And once we get Closer uh, up in time into our own age, uh, there are even more sources uh, available. So I, I tried to make use of a lot of different things because part of that chapter deals with uh, the modern world that we live in right now. So we can get statistics, for example, about black market trade country by country. We can look at different commodities, for example, the prices of ivory as it has fluctuated over the years and ivory has often been made illegal. Uh, because of what it's doing to the environment, to, to elephant populations and rhinoceros populations. We look at pangolin prices. Uh, the pangolin is one of the most uh, traded animals and really under threat because of the uh, Chinese pharmacopoeia. Mm -hmm. uh, so that has put a huge amount of pressure on, pressure on pangolin uh, populations. But we can even look uh, more generally uh, to things like the number of poaching traps found in Malaysia or Thai animal rescues per year, or even just go to one commodity in one place, like um, for example, narcotics in the Philippines, you can find pretty good data for cocaine, for ecstasy, for heroin, for marijuana, for uh, methamphetamines, all for one country, and start to kind of put these numbers together and see how these illicit histories uh, spill across the different societies of the South China Sea. Sound more interesting than official histories. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So my last question is also about the last chapter of your book. 
you ended the book with the chapter called If China Rules the Waves. So mm -hmm. I would like to ask this very question you raised yourself in this chapter. Will China rule the seas? And what if China rules the seas? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I should say from the start that I'm a historian and not uh, someone who focuses very much on the present, so I can just give my opinion. Um, but uh, I don't do this full time. I'm not a card carrying uh, scholar of the present. But yeah, the, the chapter is called If China Rules the Waves, which is a, a riff on the, the song about Britannia, rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. And it's partially uh, a meditation. It's a conclusion to the book, but it's also a, medita a meditation on how things may change on the, on the seaways of Asia. And if we think historically about it, of course, you know, we know that the Chinese from really quite ancient times uh, uh, were looking out towards the sea for different kinds of knowledge. Uh, one of the people that I focused on in the book uh, a fair bit was uh, someone named Zhao Rugua, who was mm. a portmaster in Chuanzhou in the, in the early 13th century and wrote this very important tract about uh, Chinese knowledge about uh, the seas of the Nanyang, the, the South Seas. Uh, based on the kinds of information that were coming into Chanzhou at the time. But we also know, of course, that the Chinese weren't just taking knowledge from the outside, but that uh, in certain moments, they were sending ships to other places as well. Uh, and these were not always trade ships. So, for example, during the Yuan dynasty, there were uh, in the late 13th century, two great invasions of Japan. Uh, many of us know a fair bit about this because this is a, a, a pretty commonly known episode in history. Less known is that one of these fleets, actually a, a, a third fleet, even later in the 13th century, went all the way to Java and interrupted the political histories of Java there. Uh, but probably the most famous moment, of course, is the Zhenghe moment in, in the early 15th century between 1405 and 1433. Seven different expeditions went out to the rest of Asia. And there's quite a bit of historiographical change arguing about what these voyages meant. Uh, you know, it used to be that the standard narrative was this was just flying the flag uh, kind of in post Yuan, post Mongol interruption in Chinese history and with a, a new Han Ming dynasty back in charge, that this was just flying the flag. But there is uh, some historiography now that suggests that that's not all that was just happening, that there was a, a taking stock of tributaries, there was figuring out of opportunities, et cetera. So there's a long history to these questions coming up to the present. And the projection of power feels a little bit different in this moment, perhaps. Uh, maybe that's because China has quite clearly claimed nearly all of the South China Sea. And we're entering an era now after 70 years of a kind of rule-based international order after World War II, where some of, these, some of these rules seem to be breaking apart. And at the moment that we're doing this interview, uh, that has to do with Russia and Ukraine, but there are other examples. Uh, and at the same time, there are other kind of structural changes that are happening too. China's Navy is now actually the largest Navy in the world based on the number of ships, at least. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming a much more modern Navy as well. Uh, but China's Navy has two or now three uh, aircraft carriers versus roughly 20 air, aircraft carriers that are available to the, to the United States. So the ability to exercise the projection of power is actually quite different for China's Navy than for uh, the United States. Uh, so I would say, you know, in, in Asia, relatively close to China's shores, it's not that hard to imagine a time where China might rule the waves, at least close to China, as Britain once did uh, in the lines of that famous song. Uh, but what might be possible in the S South China Sea, for example, for China, might take much longer in the open waters of the Pacific or in the Indian Ocean or something like this, where uh, the projection of power would require a much larger naval presence, more akin to uh, the size and, and power of the United States. But still, we see these bases and capabilities in places like Sri Lanka, in Djibouti, in, in the Red Sea, for example, China starting to learn how to project power in ways that uh, it had not been able to do so before. So that might take longer to be able to project power beyond the coasts of China, but that might be something in the future as well. And that will be for other scholars uh, other than me to figure out, people who look towards the present and the future 
rather than who look towards the past. Wow, thank you so much for this um, historical overview, but yet, you know, projection into the future, some projection to the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for having me, Yuan. Thank you.